Thank you, President Van Zandt. Um, so our, our first panel, we're, we're going to begin uh, with uh, Chris Cleary. Uh, Chris, Chris Cleary is presenting on hacktivists and the government. Uh, how can they help? Uh, Chris Cleary is the president of Versec uh, Government Services, and, uh, which is a private security company specializing in providing unique technical security solutions and consulting services to the US government. Uh, prior to joining Versec, Mr. Cleary was a chief operational planner at US Cyber Command uh, and uh, deployed as an officer in charge of the expeditionary cyber support element charged with planning and executing full spectrum cyber operations in support of combat operations in the CENTCOM AOR. Uh, he'll, he'll have to explain what all of those acronyms mean, uh, but, but it sounds uh, very exciting. <laughs> uh, Mr. Cleary holds a BS in history from the US uh, Naval Academy and a, and a master's uh, in national security and strategic studies from the Naval War College. I, I, I first met Chris last year, and, and I think Christopher will, will tell you that, that he uh, comes with a unique perspective. He'll, he'll, I think, have a very interesting take on government, uh, but then he can also talk a bit about hackers. He was a, he was a, um, a speaker at DEF CON a couple of years ago, and, and I think kind of comes with a very outside-the-box perspective on government and how hackers can, can kind of work together. I don't know if that sums it up correctly, but I'll turn it over uh, to you, Chris. Thanks. So a couple years ago uh, at DEF CON, I gave a talk called uh, Art of the Possible. And basically what this was all about is to try and get the hacker community to understand that there's another big piece of this that makes sort of this, this environment work. And it was the idea that, that love or hate the government or the military, what we do is we bring process to things. And if the process could be understood, you sort of understand the benefit of why, you know, the hacker communities are really good on a keyboard, can leverage from people who understand you know, achieving some sort of, okay, I'm gonna use a lot of acronyms, so beat me up as I go because I say I'm sort of second nature and I don't even realize when I'm saying them. So I'm gonna use things like end state and effects and objectives and courses of action and, and if anybody has questions as we go on, please stop me as I'm talking because I won't stop unless you tell me to. Uh, so we're at an interesting point and I call this the class of civilizations and as this environment sort of, sort of unfolds and we learn more about it, you sort of have the military, the government on one side of this equation and you have this hacker, hacktivist community on the other. Now, in a couple slides I'll get into it, so I'll, I'll bounce back and forth, but the hacktivist community really fascinates me because what I see them as, regardless of their objectives or what they're trying to achieve, I kind of use like a line from, from, uh, from Jaws. Nobody likes the great white shark, but you can appreciate it for what it is. You know, a perfect machine. It eats, it swims, it makes baby sharks, and yeah, it might kill surfers every once in a while, but if you look at it as an animal or an organization, it's, it's a fascinating creature, whether you might be afraid of it. I think the hacktivist community is a similar sort of creature that we're literally trying to understand, which has amazing capabilities, which can be learned from from the government. So before I get started, I've got to go a little bit of my background. Chris already, Chris already uh, sort of highlighted it as, uh, I think it's important to say that we're all products of our environment. And I have to very clearly state, it's, it's no secret what my environment is. Uh, a year before graduating high school, I enlisted in the Navy. Five days after graduating, I was in boot camp, and I've been in uniform in one way, shape, or form ever since. Um, I've deployed four times. I've been to Iraq twice. You know, I uh, volunteered for my second deployment. I mean, this is, this is sort of who I am. And I guess at the end of the day, I don't apologize for my stripes. But that being said, I love having conversations like this because what I don't think enough people with my background appreciate the other side of the fence. What's to be learned from that? And uh, I was laughing with Chris saying, wow, I'm really coming into the lion's den to be speaking at the new school because I'm probably, they probably have never seen anybody like me talk before. So I was saying, oh, you know, search people for fruit. I don't want people chasing me out of the building and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, again, this is who I am. This is my background. So when I have my own opinions, you gotta understand it was, it, they're bred in 20 plus years of military operations, military service, the Naval Academy, yada, yada, yada. I'm just a product of my environment. So General Alexander, and I'm sure everybody in this room knows who General Alexander is, gave a very interesting talk at uh, DEF CON this year, and it was the first. So he, came, and he wasn't like that, it's not him at DEF CON. He was in jeans and a t-shirt, and he was trying to blend in with the hacker community, and it was really cool to see him sort of get up in front of the lion's den. Um, now knowing DEF CON over the years has changed as a conference where half of the people sitting in the audience are government employees, most of them NSA employees, so it's not just the hacker community, but this was him trying to, trying to you know, put his hand out to the dog and say, hey, look, guys, sniff, I'm not, I'm not dangerous. I'm not who you think I am. But there was a lot of going back and forth, like, oh, this is General Alexander with the, you know, his uh, propaganda of, you know, NSA doesn't spy on people, and I've got no opinion on that one way or another, because I don't think the government's as capable as we all believe they are in some instances. Uh, but he came with sort of his hat in his hand, saying, hey, look, at the end of the day, 
I appreciate this environment. I appreciate what you do, whether that's true or not, to say, hey, you're my, my workforce, my future workforce. Uh, I use this analogy a lot of the times when we talk about cyber forces and cyber operations is that we have very specific, very capable forces within the government. But capacity is where we, where we tap out. We don't have as much of what you think we have. So at the end of the day, we need to surge capability, surge capacity. And this community that we're reaching out to can help us there. But then you've got to go back to that class of civilizations thing. You know, is it even possible for these two communities to work together? And I think when people like me get out there and say, hey, there is a way we can both coexist and leverage off one another so you can start moving this ball down the road. Um, so some of the players. You know, it was very interesting as I was doing this hacktivist thing. And of course, we're all familiar with Anonymous and LulzSec, which you, know, you may not have known that's their symbol, but it is. I just found it on Wikipedia. I didn't even know they had a symbol, to be perfectly honest with you. And you get all these different groups that have done different things over the year. And you go to Wikipedia and find that they've conducted certain operations. And some of these guys go back to the early 80s. And there's, there's different things they've been successful at. Um, and at the end of the day, what I think these communities have been very, suc very successful at is is showing that the kind of things you do, and I'll use the word non-kinetically, can have impact. And the, what happened in Saudi Arabia is a perfect example of that. You open up the front page of the New York Times, bam, hacker organization, you know, non-attributed right now, conducts an operation, erase a lot of uh, data, which slowed down operations for this oil company for a period of time. Now, at the end of the day, I don't know if that's what they wanted to do, but they were successful in doing it, and they showed that given a certain access or capability, they were able to achieve a certain end state or effect. Sorry. Uh, and these guys are sort of the, sort of the uh, what I'll call like the frontier players. If you look at World War I aviation, when we were getting, when the military was developing aviation, a lot of the times when they were trying to say, hey, this is now a, 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 a war fighting environment, how can we leverage this? Well, there were a lot of guys out there that knew how to fly airplanes. And at the beginning, they went and found people who knew how to fly and then turned them into military pilots. Conversely now, the military is where you want to go to learn to fly. I mean, the military is the only place you can fly a Raptor. If you want to fly the coolest airplanes on the planet, you're going to go into the military. I would argue that the coolest cyber things right going on right now are still out in the private world. And I think the government is trying to figure out how can they use what they do to train people to bring people in and say, maybe this is the place you want to learn to do the latest and greatest cyber whatever. Um, I use this as an example because when I, when I talk to the hacker community, I, I bring this up, and this was a slide that I used at, uh, at uh, DEF CON, and I say, hey, look, you know, the analogy of a sniper and a deer hunter. Well, if you look at a hacker and who uses a computer or a military guy who uses a computer, the computer's the rifle. The computer's the commonality. I mean, you can take a deer hunter who likes to go out for sport and a military-trained sniper and put them next to each other, and they could probably hit the same target at the same range. The difference is when I put the rifle scopes on the target, I mean, that guy, that military guy looking at that guy through his reticle could be looking at him for a million different reasons, just to simply watch what he's doing, to observe his movement, you know. But the deer hunter's there to shoot the deer. And I think the difference is just because you have a certain capability, i.e. the ability to pull a trigger, put a round down range and hit a target, doesn't mean that's always why you're in the field. And I think when you look at military operations, the way you do business, just because you're doing online operations, doesn't mean you're hacking into another guy or you're, you're, you're going into somebody's privacy. It's just the way we do it. I mean, we put ships at sea all the time, but we haven't fired a missile at another ship in a long time, since the, uh, you know, per, uh, the Gulf War oil rig thing, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, I digress, because I can't think of the specifics. Uh, so I get into this. Um, why we need the hacktivist community or the hacker community, whatever you want to call it. So there's a deterrence philosophy out there that, this is again a born and bred, military trained, yada yada, says there's the five C's to deterrence. And if you think about nuclear deterrence, you know, capability, capacity, commitment, communicate, credible. As an example, the U.S. is the only country that could really profess a nuclear deterrence because we're the only ones that have ever used one before. So we've demonstrated we have the capability and we have the capacity. We're committed because we've used one in the past which communicates our ability to do that and we're credible, i.e. we've done it. When you start looking at cyber deterrence, shy of what happened just recently with uh, Stuxnet and some other <laughs> operations that may or may not be attributed back to the U.S. government, look at the Georgia and Estonia operations. Um, the Russians, whether they took credit for it, said that, hey, I can use non-kinetic effects to achieve a military end state. So we're going to go in and we're going to conduct a hacker operation which is going to enable certain follow-on forces, yada, yada. So, you could say that Russia has begun to come out and profess a cyber policy. Hey, we're going to do these five Cs. China, on the other hand, you could say exactly the same. Hey, 
I'm showing you it would do this. I don't believe the United States has come up and done the same thing. So when you say, hey, now we're going to look at the hacktivist community and the government or the Department of Defense, you know, you could argue that we both have capability and we've demonstrated. I mean, we've got the NSA and we've got the CIA and we've got certain, certain places where this capability exists. Capacity, I argue, that goes to the hacktivist community. Um, I would argue there's many more of them than there are of us. And they conduct operations on a regular basis. So you can say commitment. I mean, anonymous, lulsec, call to the dead cow, you know, Iran, whatever you want to call it, conducts operations and they do it publicly and they take credit for it. So you can say they're committed to their operations. They communicate it, i.e., they're doing it. And they're definitely credible because they've pulled off certain things. Where we on the other, so I say, hey, hacktivists win by a landslide. I mean, they're doing a much better job of doing the five C's of deterrence. Um, and I'll use anonymous as an example. So I'm, as I'm doing some of my research, and uh, I didn't know who was going to be here, I'm like, oh, I'm definitely not going to poke some anonymous guy in the eye because I don't want him coming after me personally. Because when I watched one of their videos, uh, I actually got scared by it. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, here's an organization that, that uh, and to use one more reference, if anybody's familiar with a book called The Starfish and the Spider, The uh, Unlimitedless Power of Decentralized Organizations. Anonymous is the classic example of that. You don't know who they are. You don't really know who's in charge. Anybody can join. And it's sort of a collective of people who kind of pushed in one direction or another, go off and do certain things. Well, one of them could be, wow, Chris Cleary gave a talk. He said anonymous is blah, blah, blah. Well, let's go after Chris Cleary. So by that means anonymous, I think you guys are doing God's work. Good on you. Um, and they've demonstrated all these things. So then the flip side, oh, but then I said, but okay, so you can't really write the government off because, you know, capability and capacity is classified. We're really not going to talk about that. Um, commitment is sort of undecided. You hear political guys wish wash over this, so it's hard to come up with any kind of legitimate thing that you're going to go push back either to nation states or to local adversaries to say we're going to do something about it. Uh, you know, communicate, again, I go back because there's too many people fighting over the same issue, and then credible and not really. You know, we have yet to do anything either to our adversaries nation state wise, okay, Stuxnet being, being a one off if that is in fact something that we did. Um, and, you know, we just haven't demonstrated to any of our, any of these other people on the field that we have any credibility when it comes to sort of cyber operations. But so what does the DOD do in particular? I'm not necessarily going to give the government credit for this because I think the DOD, because we're in uniform, because we're, we're bred a certain way, we bring certain things that the government tries to do, but yet there's too many, too many fingers in the pie and they don't, in my opinion, they, they screw some things up. So then when you have the same thing, well, organization, I'll go back to the fact that I'll call this a tie. You know, uh, Anonymous, even though it's a very decentralized, distributed organization, you can still says has some organization to it. They have a media arm. They put videos out. There's a way to join. There's emails to go to. Um, resources has got to go to the, to the Department of Defense. If we have anything, we have money. We have people. We have equipment. We have square footage. We have air conditioning. We have plumbing. You know, you can do things because we just have the ability to house it or maintain it or equip it. Um, access. Well, access runs a, a gambit, but you could call it, you know, we have the area ability to go into the denied areas. We have access to certain technology that might not be a, uh, available to everybody else. Um, we have access to, you know, foreign partners. So that, that's a, access is a very broad term, but that's something that we bring to it. You know, intelligence, okay, you could DOD, military intelligence, I mean, beat me up, blah, blah, blah. But we have access to intelligence. I mean, we have people that all they do all day long is go to gather information that is then given over to planners um, to, come up with, to come up with ideas, solutions. Hey, how can I take this information, given a commander's end state, hey, this is what I want done, and come up with a plan to achieve that? Um, and then we got planning, uh, which is basically what I've done for the last five-ish years of my life. Uh, so then I say, you know, hooray, taxes, you know, taxes at work, this is what we do. So, all right, the next two, this, this next slide is an eye chart, just, you know, you don't have to read it, this is just sort of a visual representation of how we do what we do. So, operational design, um, that middle of the joint operations planning process, military planners, this is our Bible, catcher in the rye, whatever you want to call it, this is, this is how we do things. So, when we're given certain objectives, and here's where I think that the hacktivist community, or people who are going to do those kind of things, I would argue that there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to what they do other than, you know, it's the issue of the day and they want to, you know, WikiLeaks this or anonymous, they're not going to let us charge credit cards, so I'm going to tank the Bank of America. Okay, that's interesting and you have a capability to do that, but if you thought through it a lot more detailed, maybe you could have brought more of an effect to the Bank of America, not that I'm advocating that, I'm just saying that this is a way to think through the process and, you know, we have, you know, national end states, so these are the things we're kind of doing, we crush it through this operational planning process with, 
you know, uh, you know, what are we trying to do? What are our centers of gravity? And then of that comes courses of action and plans and branches and sequels and all the other garbage because that's how we think. That's how, you know, everything's got to be a plan. And that very first slide that I, that I showed had a saying on the bottom, you know, uh, uh, plans are useless, planning is essential. And if that's the quintessential definition of the military. We're always planning to do something, but then the, the, def the, the saying that, you know, no good plan survives first contact with the enemy, which is the truest thing I've ever heard because they never do. But if you're not planning, you don't have at least rhyme or reason or something to fall back on or something to maneuver with to renegotiate or replan or reengage. So that's just how we think. So then one of the examples of one of the products that we would put together as we're doing our planning is uh, you know, a center of gravity analysis. And up here very quickly, you know, when you do a center of gravity, whatever you're trying to go after, there's a center of gravity. Center of gravity are made up of critical capabilities. You know, what allows that center of gravity to function? Those capabilities have requirements. Those requirements have vulnerabilities associated with them. And when you start going through this thing, what you find is the vulnerabilities, i.e. a bank site that is, that is, that is uh, vulnerable to denial of a service attack. There's a vulnerability. My effect would be, uh, hey, I want to degrade that bank site's ability to conduct traffic. Well, I know they're susceptible to vulnerability attacks, so my task becomes denial of service attack against publicly facing website where bank transactions are taking place. That's sort of the thought process that goes through that. So then, you know, how do we get there? And then, of course, in parentheses, this is even a good idea. You know, do these communities, should they start coming closer together, or is it even possible for them to come closer together? And then that, you know, that saying at the bottom, you know, if every good citizen should be a soldier and yada, yada, you know, the Israelis operate this way. You know, everybody in Israel is prepared to, to defend their country. Um, there are certain communities here that could potentially be leveraged in the defense of the country or, you know, not only from an offensive standpoint, but just, I use an example like uh, Hurricane Katrina. You know, what if, there was a, what if there was a community of people willing to, willing to respond to Katrina that said, hey, I'm not going to contract out to, you know, name defense contractor, but you guys are all on a list, you know how to build wireless networks. So after an emergency, what I need you to do is get in a truck, we're going to give you equipment, you're going to fly down to Katrina, or you're going to go into the Superdome and just set up wireless connectivity so these guys can start contacting their families. I mean, there's good that can come out of the hacktivist community responding to a crisis to enable you know, uh, humanitarian aid, uh, communications, uh, help grandma reconfigure her router in her house because it went down. I mean, it doesn't always have to be, you know, hacktivists attacking China or Iran or Russia. There's lots of reasons that you could leverage this community. So then I say, you know, we've all seen the Live Free Die Hard movie, right? Have we all seen the Live Free Die Hard movie? Nobody's seen the Live Free Die Hard? All right, so if this was DEF CON, everybody's seen the Live Free Die Hard movie. So in the Live Free Die Hard movie, basically, it's uh, the bad guy's a hacker. And the bad guy is a disgruntled government employee that's going to show the government how open to attack they are. And, you know, I would argue that in the movie, they go through this process. And I won't show you that again, but, you know, center of gravity, United States government, banking, law enforcement, and what he does is he, again, another eye chart. I'm just going to show this as an example. Now, as a military planner, for the people who had seen the movie, and again, we don't have time to get into the movie, if you took what happened in the movie and tried to make rhyme or reason of it, you could put it into certain lines of operation. I mean, the bad guy was doing certain things. And if you really watched and studied the movie, you'd see that from a military planning perspective, he had certain, OK, at this point, after I've gathered this much information, I'm ready to move on to this phase. If this doesn't work, I need to do this or this. But what was interesting about the movie, it was all about not the cyber attack. It was about stealing money. So what you saw was the cyber operations that were going on that were the cool thing. That was what the movie and John McCain running around with planes and shooting bad guys. It was all about the bad guy stealing money, but he enabled that operation through all these non-kinetic cyber attacks that, if you, again, if you saw the movie, how things leveraged and branched and sequeled and moved out, and you could lay it out in sort of an operation and say, oh, I got it. It was just a well thought out operation that had a specific end state in mind. Of course, John, bad guy, screws it all up because you know he engages the, the, the villain and doesn't allow it to happen. So you know, I say, did Hollywood do their homework? Well, it was based off a paper written about 10 years ago saying, is a large cyber attack like this possible? The producers got that paper, read it, oh, this would be an interesting movie, it becomes a movie. Um, I said it was focused on the, the execution phase of the operation, but what I thought was more interesting as a military planner is what was the two years before this operation, what did it look like? You know, I said to the guy, the bad guy in the movie is a disgruntled GS-15. Where did he get that? Again, you haven't seen the movie, but he drives around in this big, 18-wheeler with all these computers in it. Like, where'd he get that? That just wasn't on the lot somewhere. That thing cost millions of dollars. And I didn't, no GS-15 I know had the millions and millions of dollars it would have cost to, to launch that operation. 
he's got all these French like assassins running around. I'm like, where'd he get those guys? Where'd he get a helicopter? You know? So then, of course, my theory is because they were French bad guys, the French must have approached him and said, hey, I want you to pause this operation. We'll fund you. Will you do this? But the more important thing is what was going on. The French just wouldn't have funded this guy to go steal this money. In my opinion, what's going on in Europe as the U.S. is under this cyber attack is the French invading Germany. You know, we'll keep the U.S. busy because we've always pissed off at the Germans, and this gives our opportunity to, they'll stay out of the fight because we've just launched this huge cyber attack, which allows us to invade Berlin, is an example. I'm just making that up. So, real world example. So, again, whale wars. Who watches whale wars? Nobody watches whale wars. You guys got to watch more TV. I guess that probably doesn't happen here. Um, whale wars. Whale wars is uh, these uh, activists that go off and try and degrade Chinese, Chinese, Japanese whaling operations down in the uh, Arctic Ocean. Pretty cool. I like it. I like it from a naval officer's perspective. And I always say that. Um, yeah, it's cool to save whales, but I get upset at them because they're all horrible mariners. You know, they're just what they're doing at sea. Like, I want to strangle the captain every day because I'm like, ah, you could be doing so much more. I don't care about the whales necessarily. Your, your operations are horrible. You're not using your ships right. You know, your helicopter should be doing this. And, but I appreciate it for what they're trying to do. And if you've watched this show over the years, they've, they've gotten more resources. They go from one ship to three. They had four. It ran into a whale, uh, one of the one of the... Japanese whaling ships and went to the bottom. So I was like, yay, Japanese. They sunk one of their ships, but anyways. But they try to degrade the operations using, I'll call, kinetic means. They're out there engaging the whaling fleet, trying to stop whaling operations. And they have certain tactics and techniques that they use to prevent the Japanese from being successful in what they're doing. But what if this kinetic, at sea, you know, activist navy linked up with a group like Anonymous? Well, then. The problem gets much, much more interesting. And here's where I go to why, in this case, dangerous for the Japanese whaling fleet, but there's certain instances where this could work. Well, now if I start looking at the Japanese whaling fleet operations, there's a lot more things that go on to make that operation successful than just those ships at sea. Those ships have got to come back to port. They've got to be maintained. They've got to be fueled. The product has to be distributed. I'm sure they have a website where people say, oh, I want to buy whale meat. You know, go and put an order in, and then they deal with FedEx, and it's got to be, you know, there are so many more things that you could go after than just the ships at sea. So to amplify their operations, if they worked with an anonymous who understood the way that the entire operation worked, now you could have a group like Anonymous going after shipping manifests, uh, repairs on the ship being made, um, could engage guys directly in their homes. I mean, there's so many more things that they could do to amplify that operation. Again, if, so nobody's seen the movie, so don't tell the guys I said that, because they'll start calling the anonymous guys. Oh, we've got to do all this stuff for the Japanese whaling. But that's where that, that operation would get amplified and even more dangerous, or in my case, more effective. Again, not necessarily condoning the action, but appreciating the act. You know, the whale, or the, the shark eating the swimmer. Wow, that's horrible. But man, did you see that huge shark? You see the big teeth on him, man. I, well, the way he hunted it, and the way he engaged it, and the way he kills his prey is really kind of interesting. And that's what I sort of appreciate about the hacktivist community. If you just watch what they do, not necessarily who they do it to or why, it's pretty amazing to see these guys go about some of their operations. And there's a lot of things that the government could learn from that. So I sort of, I sort of my get off the stage slide is something like this. So help wanted. The question is, now that General Alexander has gone out and asked for this sort of way to, hey, we can work together. Well, how do you make that happen? And it's not easy, again, because of the clash of civilizations. There's not a lot of guys that want to come in and work at the fort and go through security clearances. There's not a lot of guys that want to join the military and cut their hair and put on a uniform and have to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't like doing that. Uh, but I'm senior now and I don't have to get up as early as I had to back in the day, so it's not as bad as things go on. Um, but the, the concept of you know when and if the balloon went up for disaster recovery or maybe far right side of the scale, you know, nation state war, if it were to be, at the end of the day, we're short on resources. How could we leverage the hacktivist community to be able to augment what we'll call standing forces to bring additional capacity to uh, to whatever it is we choose to stand up. And I think that's, the, that's the, uh, the real trick. And again, my sort of get off the stage speech is, if more people that have been in my environment that appreciate what they do, that's where the linkage can start coming together. You might not condone the target, but you might appreciate the execution of the act and say there's a way that the things that you're doing in the environment that I can learn from, i.e. the, the pre-World War I guy who knows how to fly an airplane, now, maybe I need to teach you how to do a reconnaissance mission, or uh, maybe in, in you should get me into aerial combat. 
Um, not saying that cyber has to go in that direction, but the, the, the interesting thing is, and again, I think uh, uh, Pandora's box has been opened to the, to the degree. And uh, the one slide that I didn't put in here is, uh, if anybody's familiar with a company called CrowdStrike, uh, CrowdStrike is a private company that's come into light that sort of professes there's another way to do security, and it's sort of an aggressive way to do security. Uh, you know, I'm not going to shoot the guy coming in my house, but I'll put a gun to him and hold him down until the police get here. And that's sort of a way that they're thinking through this, which is kind of an aggressive way to, to attack the problem. But the theory is, hey, you know, I would love to call 911 when somebody's breaking into my house, but it does take them amount of time to get there. Uh, and, you know, if I'm a gun owner or I have a baseball bat, you know, there are some things that I have to do in my own best interest to protect myself and my four small children. See, I have children, so I'm a good guy. Uh, the, uh, but hey, I dialed 911. You just couldn't, so now that there's industries or business that again are losing tons of intellectual capital, and of course, you know, oil company that starts operations, the point is that lives could ultimately be start being lost by those things. Um, and intellectual capital, as we lose, especially when it comes into weapon systems, now that we need to invest more money to defeat the weapon systems they just stole. So it's one of those things that there's a, I see the price of entry being lowered and the kinds of operations that are being done get raised. And I'm really waiting for the story that says, you know, hacker X did action and private citizen Y went back after them. Hey, FBI, law enforcement community, I would love your assistance but you just put me on hold. So I had to take care of acts. I had to do things, you know, I had to take care of it on my own. Um, I think that's the next interesting sort of, sort of environment that's gonna open up. And you're gonna see the hacktivist community do some things like Spider-Man. For good, maybe not in the right way, maybe not condoned by law enforcement, but maybe the end state is they, they take down some bad guys. Hasn't happened yet. It's around the corner. Um, and I'm really interested to see that next sort of evolution uh, of this environment. And with that, I'm right at 25 minutes. Does anybody have any questions, I guess, before we do the thing? Whale Wars, talk Whale Wars. <laughs> Love that show. All right. Thank you very much. The one question that I had is, is one of the arguments that I heard at DEF CON was um, that, that hacktivists, people that, that want to discover vulnerabilities, say on a Cisco router or something like that, are often challenged by government and industry because the, the idea is, well, wait a minute, you're, what you're doing is illegal, you shouldn't be digging around in our service. But their response is, well, listen, you're not going to uncover these vulnerabilities without us, and, and we feel that it's important for our security and the safety of people that use your, your system. So I think it's sort of an interesting balance where what, what sometimes is being done in the ethical hacking or, or hacktivism community isn't, isn't always necessarily legal, but it certainly is important. Um, and, and I know that the government can't just come out and say we value that, but, but certainly there has to be some value for that. I, I think it's like a, on a case-by-case -case basis, and I, I use an analogy like this. If you, if you were coming home and you, you were coming up to your house and you saw a guy in your front yard that you didn't recognize, your initial reaction would be, Who's, this guy's trespassing, what's in my yard? And as you sort of snuck up on him and got closer, you noticed he was in your flower beds weeding, cut, pushing a lawnmower. And you're like, oh, all right, he's cleaning my yard picking trash out of my yard, or he's doing, or he put bars on my windows, or he did, so he, he made sure my front door was light. He didn't, I saw him litching it, and then he opened it, and then he locked it from the inside and reclosed it. I was like, ah. So then you're, then I always said the joke would be, your initial reaction would be like, are you thirsty? Can I get something to drink? You know, I appreciate everything you've done here, but your initial reaction would be, what's this guy doing in my, doing on my property? Um, and I think that, because we don't have any other way to, to you know, because it's hard to prove that you're there for legitimate reasons, or you're there with the best intent. Um, one of the things that I was, that I was trying to say at, at the hacker community is an example of the guys that show up there and say, hey, I have a botnet with 200,000 nodes in it because I compromise all these machines. I'm like, that's interesting. Hey, congratulations. Good for you. Wouldn't it be interesting if you came back next year and you said, I patched 400,000 machines. I found a particular vulnerability and I went out in the wild and I just patched these machines. Why? Well, I don't know. Nobody said I couldn't and it's not necessarily illegal. It's no more illegal than I was to put a piece of malware. Well, that's illegal. I'm sorry. So yeah, but they have no way to stop me from putting a piece of malware or compromising a vulnerability on a machine. In this case, I just pushed a patch to it, you know, which, which locked down a particular portion of these machines that are all infected by a particular piece of malware. Um, I think that's interesting. You know, nobody beats up people for just picking up trash on the street. How do you police the internet in a way that says, as I cruise through it, I'll see things that don't look right and just take care of them? Because, you know, that's uh, malware that shouldn't be there and I'll clean it up. I think that's that's the model, and but and normally you'll look like you're intruding, and that's the. 
Hi, Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I have a question about kind of crowdsourcing intelligence analysis. So as I said in, in my introduction, I'm a huge fan of certain science fiction writers like Charles Strauss, mm -hmm. Werner Vinge, who are hard sci-fi writers that base most of what they write on what they see as the very near future, um, usually based on hard science and technology change and so forth. So you, you've probably read some of them. In, uh, in one of Vinge's novels, he imagines a, a near future about 40 years out where intelligence is really crowdsourced. Uh, and the community only can function to do threat analysis in real time by literally distributing it out to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of analysts. And he never really explains how they sanitize the data so that all of those analysts who are working on it actually could be doing that analysis sure. without compromising the mission of the analysis. Um, he writes really compellingly about how the people respond to a, a specific biotech threat in the novel. Uh, but he never breaks that down. And I'm curious if there's anything that you can talk about um, in this kind of context that is connected to that kind of vision of how an analysis would proceed. So, so the, the, the cool thing that when I talk about cyber, which, which makes it such a, an interesting environment, is this is, not, this is not refining uranium. You know, I do not need millions of dollars in centrifuges. I can go out to Best Buy and buy a computer and be a smart guy and write code and do the certain things. So, um, I'm at, I'm at uh, DEF CON this year, and I'm walking around, and I'm seeing one of the vendors there. One of the vendors there had a very interesting picture of a, what they called was a, one of the Chinese intrusion sets. And I looked at it, and I was like, wow, that looks really familiar. You know, how did you get this? Because to me, I had a similar picture that took me much, much longer to put together than probably he put together that I would have called classified because of the way we gathered the information. He just went and gathered it through open source information. It was probably more detailed than the picture that I had. So the whole idea is that a lot of what we're doing in this environment, although the, the intent and maybe why we're doing it or what we're looking at is classified, but the how you do it is not. I mean, a lot of people have the capability to do this. So to say that there's a lot of people in this environment that can come up with the same intelligence that I'm going to put a classification label on that just has the ability to do this open, what we'd call open source or crowdsourced. Uh, and I think that's going to get much, much more prevalent, especially if people can maybe voluntarily report they see certain information. Now the question is who would you give it to and how would they do something with it? Uh, but there are a lot of private organizations that are doing this very thing and then selling that intelligence back to business to say, hey, I see something that you don't. And this, the government may or may not see this and they may have classified it, uh, but I don't have to because I, I obtained it through open source or through what we could unclassified means. I, I think that's going to be huge um, in the upcoming future because the government is not the only one that has cornered the market on the ability to operate in this environment. As a matter of fact, I would say they're, they're potentially behind when it comes to this kind of thing. Great. Uh, any other questions? Or, yeah. Hi. I'm, I'm curious to know how, what kinds of things you think the military could do to actually encourage hacker participation. So for example, hackers have an ethic, right? Mm -hmm. And um, some people see something as simple as packet sniffing as illegal, and some people think of it as intrusive, and others just so, something you do. Uh, would the D Department of Justice have to back off on following through on discouraging hacker creativity? I think it's kind of the, the, the same model as if, uh, if you owned a rifle and were shooting at your backyard, people would probably frown on that. Um, and I think they look at a lot of the things that you do from your house as maybe frowned upon, the kind of things that were intrusive. But what if they had, could build an environment where you could come in and on the weekends become a GS-13 or, a, you know, you're not a military guy, but you had some sort of official cover that they could not, not cover as in secretive, but official. Hey, now we, we want you to do these sort of use your capabilities to do certain things that enable some of our missions or help us collect information or you show us another technique that, that we weren't aware of. Um, similarly to the way that the, it would be really cool, I have my private pilot's license. I wish I could show up and fly a Raptor on the weekends. Wow, that would be really cool. But that's not afforded to me because I'm not that kind of guy. Because I haven't gone through two years of flight school and blah, 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 blah. But in this environment, I don't need two years of flight school to be able to come in and do some of those, on, I'll call them online operations. And I think as we go to build capacity, there's going to have to a way that says, I'm going to identify certain people that are willing to participate in this mission. Um, I can cut them out of the classified part because, again, I think that a lot of the operations they're doing are not necessarily classified because of the tools they're using because they're available to everybody. Uh, and maybe allow them the top cover to do certain missions that they 
they wouldn't feel comfortable doing from their, doing from their home. Uh, and that, I believe, is that next sort of generation of how do I now, how do I now, how do I leverage this resource that are doing it all, you know, you could argue illegally or, where, or you know, at risk and provide them an environment where they can do it condoned, if that's, if that sort of makes sense. I think that's sort of the next evolution. Great, thanks. Any other final questions? Uh, if, if you don't have any, uh, or if you're uh, a little shy at the moment, don't forget that Chris will be on the panel. So please keep in mind, and, and uh, we'll hope to get a larger discussion going. Um, so next up, we have uh, Dr. Simon Thompson. Uh, just give us a couple of minutes to get set up. We're excited to have Dr. Uh, Simon Thompson here with us. He's going to talk about unknown unknowns, why the biggest thing in big data is the thing you know the least. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going from, from sort of a hacktivism, cybersecurity angle uh, more into to big data. Uh, Dr. Thompson uh, is the Director of Commercial Solutions at Esri. Uh, Simon is responsible for a wide-ranging business sector that includes insurance, banking, real estate, uh, real, re retail, manufacturing, and media. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in applying geographic data analysis to solve business, industry, and social issues. Simon's knowledge and experience in creating new insights and immediately applicable intelligence out of complex data has been applied to many different business problems from understanding risk, improving business and community resilience to supply chain innovation. Uh, so Dr. Thompson, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Um, I hate writing bios and I hate having bios written for me. Um, there's the element of BS in there that uh, always scares me when I get up to talk. Um, you know, an advert, Esri are hiring for big data experts. Um, you know, location and big data are, um, you know, really, really converging. And what I want to do is talk about, you know, some of the areas that are driving this. You know, the Internet of Things is everything. Yeah? It's everywhere. It's become everything because just about 90% of the information that's big data is being sourced through these type of capabilities. Our smartphones, the transactions that go on in banks, uh, every tweet, every check in every Instagram. You know, we've, we've changed the way we photograph places. You know, we used to be out there when I was a kid with Polaroids taking those photographs in anticipation that you know, 60 seconds later and lots of shaking that I would have a picture that I could share with everybody. And I had to share it with people by physically giving it to each other. Now we take a photograph, we bump phones, everybody can see the newborn baby, whether you're in Sydney or Singapore or, you know, in LA or New York. And everybody can have that instantly through this, through this capability. is everywhere. Yeah. Location is everywhere. Just about everything we do, every transaction, every check-in, every share, every time we connect to the internet on our phones, our device, it generates a location because there's a location for everything. What's actually happening is this is driving data. 25 years ago in my postgraduate research, I was actually creating databases and indexing structures for maps. And I was using databases with 10 to the 24 storage spaces, you know, 10 to the 24. And I remember going home to my mum and saying, I've designed a, a database which has a septillion um, a, amount of information in it. You know, there's a septillion data points that can be s stored in this. And she went, you just made that up. <coughs> right? And I, I made that up. I said, no, I really designed this database, 1024, and doing all this interesting things. She said, no, you just made the word up. Septillion. You know, like she had heard a million and billion and trillion was kind of interesting, right? And then, of course, 14 years ago, along comes Google, and everybody finds out this abbreviation of this word, yeah? But we didn't have this concept of huge numbers before. They were foreign and alien to us. But now, the every day. You know, today, a petabyte of data flows across the internet. It's actually created on the internet. There's more data created every single day on the internet than there was 20 years ago when I was creating those databases. Yeah? 
That's an incredible fact. If you take your average bank, they have as much information as 400 million iPads. Another way to look at it before Apple came out with a mini is that you could have actually stacked those on top of each other and got to the moon. That's your average bank. It has more data than YouTube. Yeah? These companies have vast amounts of data. So we need to rethink everything because of big data. We need to rethink the way we did it. When I started off, I was designing databases to manage the data we created. Now, we actually think about the way we structure data for the databases we have and the purposes for which I want to apply it. We've almost flipped part of that. And 84%, 84% of what? 84% of the universe can't be measured. It's dark matter, it's dark energy, it's missing, it's lost, we can't explain it. But I would argue that 84% also applies to big data. 84% of your data universe cannot be used if it can't be structured, if it can't be united, if it can't be unified. If we can't go from context to reason and fact abstraction, we can't go from understanding and comprehension. There's no logical path between the two. And because there is a location for everything, we can start to apply this to dark data. We can start to actually join unstructured data to structured data. Now, we as humans have evolved to understand location. Now, when we talk through the sort of past, you know, our big brains, people said, well, actually, it's because of language. But there are some people that have posited that actually language was one of the only, one of many drivers. And Dawkins have said that actually mapping, understanding our geography, understanding the environment in which we live, was the most fundamental thing associated with that. And I want to come back to that idea, because when you actually start to look at this concept of geography and language, the two things are incredibly um, united. And in fact, if you take this argument about men and women, you know, and that women can't read maps and can't navigate, the fact is that men can't describe colors. Yeah? So in the, in the generalization, women of visual communicate in a different way artistically Men theoretically communicate mathematically. But there's, those are gross generalizations. But the language connects these two things. And the amazing thing about geography, it's a mix of <coughs> art and science. It's a combination of those two things, our right brain and our left brain. The expression of language into context and the way that we use context to actually create that. So there's 70 billion. 70 billion smartphone apps are actually expected to be available in 2014. We'll be downloading 70 billion apps. There are as many smartphones on the planet as there are people. Yeah? That means every single one of us will have about 12 apps by this. This comes from Gartner. What's actually going to occur is we'll have 70 trillion shared locations. If every one of those apps, three times a day, shared its location, when I get up in the morning, where I go for lunch, and when I get home, we'll have 70 trillion points to deal with. How are we going to manage that? How are we going to use it? How are we going to derive context from that? Because one of the things about IT is we spent 20 years focusing on the wrong thing. We focus on technology. Every business I go to, I talk to an IT guy who tells me about their common operating environment and the databases they have and all these other things that they have. And they've never really focused on information. And suddenly this really squishy concept called big data has come along. And it's the buzzword of so many conferences. Last week I was in DC at a banking conference. Big data was there. Oh, two weeks ago it was big data. Now, I was at a marketing conference last week in Vegas. 
big data was there. I go to real estate conferences, big data. You know, insurance, big data. You know, everywhere in business, it's big data. And you say, well, what is it? And IBM stand there and they say, here's my smarter big data strategy. Put it in a database. You know, we talk about Hadoop and MapReduce and all of these things, yeah? <coughs> but they're all technologies. And I think the challenge is when we start to look at the information that comes out of it, because ultimately, we need data technologies. We need data experts. We need people that can take all that thing. Because it's not really been ever about information technology. It's always been the technologies of data. And the equation and the discussions has been backwards. And as we look at big data, big data technologies, we need to start to apply them, contextualize, do something with them. And I would argue that location technology is a major way to simplify, to reduce the complexity, because we all understand this. The challenge is to contextualize that location and build it into analytics, to start to actually make sense of it. And these organizations are trying to do this. If we think about physical bricks and mortar stores, you know, Macy's, Starbucks, Best Buy, all those companies, you know, they're trying to work out how do I take my online experience of users, my media investments, my advertising, my marketing, and I'm spending millions and millions of dollars on driving through social media, getting people to tweet, creating a hashtag that says Macy's is cool, I love New York, um, you know, pink um, peep toe shoes, whatever it is that's trying to drive, analyze the sentiment, do all these things. That's all in one world out there, you know, the cyber world. Same time, I have stores where those products are available. I want to bring the people that are living in that world on a smartphone into my stores. I want them to buy that product. But I also need to reconcile across how many of those products do I need? Where do I need those products? Where are my customers coming from? Who are those customers? What do they look like? How do I take all of this technology and this information and put it into business context? So I actually have business analytics that I can take this raw data, extract the facts, do something with it, so that I can apply business insight to this. I can optimize what I want to do. I can understand the context. I can validate, I can improve this thing. So 5 to 6% of businesses, if they apply, sorry, if businesses <coughs> apply big data analytics, they will actually generate a 5 to 6% increase in profitability. This was, came up from a Harvard Business Review from two researchers at MIT. That's an incredible gain. If I start to apply big data analytics, I get 5 to 6% increase in profitability and productivity. Nobody in the business world at this moment in time has a way to improve the fundamentals of retailing, banking, insurance, which will give that type of gain. Yeah? There is no way to do it by reorganizing the way your business operates, but there is a way to do it by reorganizing the way your business operates on top of its data. Yeah? This means that data is right in the center of this. You know, this book, um, Competing on Analytics, changed the way we think about business data and business insights. We shifted from this idea of business intelligence, an $8 billion market, into this idea of business analytics, a $34 billion market. And fundamentally, location matters. This idea of who am I? What am I doing? Where am I doing this? And we all talk about the social graph. Yeah? We have a social geograph. The things we're doing in that social space actually have place. It has location. It has context. And what people are doing is they're actually mapping out that social geograph. Because where connects the who to the what? Location provides insight. So a location is where we are, but the geography of the space 
actually tells us who we are. It tells us why, why I'm there. And if I'm looking at it from the other side, to pick up on Chris's operational context, it starts to explain what I might be doing. If I analyzed every one of your phones, 2 o'clock in the morning for 200 days, I could guarantee with 90 plus percent certainty that I know where you live. If I analyze it 2 o'clock in the afternoon for those 200 days, I could with 90 percent certainty guarantee where you were unless it's me and I'm traveling around the world so much that you know, it's always at a conference or a trade show. Yeah? But geography is this connector. It's a way that clarifies information, it abstracts the facts, it applies context, it communicates ideas. It's a way to start to explore. So here's my smartphone, and I analyze myself um, in a recent track. So you know, here we are, two points. I can bring that information. You've all contextualized this thing automatically. We've used our brains, the things we've evolved to do. <coughs> You've recognized the pattern that there's a pathway. There are some dots that mean something. This is Starbucks. But I start and I end a journey in pursuit of something. I start at my hotel, yes, and I go to Starbucks. And I'm not a coffee drinker, so I'm actually on the path for hot chocolate. Right? So I'm out there looking for these hot chocolates. But my path isn't logical. Yeah? I start out, and if you follow my tracks, there's only 25 pieces of data in this. It's not big data, but this is a huge big data problem. Because if I start from the hotel and I travel in direction, I've got some context now. So it's doing such a... I turn north, um, and I'm doing something, but immediately I stop, and I go back on myself. Why did I do that? Well, actually, I've checked up that Starbucks there and seen you know, what it's like. And I continue a journey, and I turn right. But now I've turned right. I carry on past the, uh, the shortest path, my end point. So that in itself adds context in terms of it being purposeful. I, I stop doing what I might have thought if I was looking at my journey and my objectives and I've done something else. So in Chris's kind of mission and operational stuff, we're actually looking at this you know, in advance. I'm trying to predict what we're doing. And I need to contextualize this. So if I'm trying to predict my behavior because I want to offer coupons to this, and I'm Starbucks, I need to be testing every single point along that route against my Starbucks database. When I stop, why am I stopping? What am I doing? When I go somewhere else, what am I doing? The possibilities of what I might be doing are magnitudes beyond what we're able to compute and calculate. All those possibilities, there's hundreds of billions of those. So I might not know, even with 25 simple bits of data, what I'm actually intending to do. Yet everybody is trying to get me a coupon. So I can go and get social media. I can mine that and says, well, Starbucks is packed. Try on 42nd Street. OK, now you've got some context. You know from my first location, I'm in New York. I just said I'm in 42nd Street, geography, yeah, a location. And I'm going to Starbucks. Now I can extract all of the Starbucks in New York and reduce these billions of possibilities to actually about 230. 30 Starbucks in Manhattan. But 42nd Street, so I now go and do geographic analysis and I take all the Starbucks which are on 42nd Street, so here they are. And I've done that by adding a little envelope around it of 10, you know, 10 feet 42nd Street. But actually there's that one to the south there that's not inside the corridor. And the reason it's not inside the corridor, it's not actually on 42nd Street. But conceptually, it is. Yeah? Its address is Broadway, but it's as near to 42nd Street as anything else is. So if I zoom in, if I set my data with a very small sort of wing window of certainty, I've actually missed the context of that piece of data. That piece of data is actually very important to me in terms of understanding this journey. 
because that piece of data is an inflection point in my decision making. So I've actually said at this point that I'm going to try to do something else. And if I set my lens, if I set the viewpoint of my data too tight when I'm managing this information, I actually am in great danger of missing the context of actually just having facts and no context and understanding, no comprehension of what is it I'm trying to do. So all this information has bounding boxes, geographic bounding boxes, bounding boxes in terms of the analysts and anal analytics I want to perform. So here's Times Square, and I can aggregate all of that information together. But Times Square and 42nd Street, in terms of these three Starbucks, also overlap and intersect. So there's not one single answer. There's multiple answers. There are multiple contexts in which we need to do this analysis. And in the end, I go and find my Starbucks, and it's in a hotel. And the hotel actually has a different address. But it's also within the context of Times Square. And these are the things that these businesses are actually trying to do. They're trying to bring the where context together in terms of this. They're using where and geography to simplify and organize the properties of big data, its volume, its velocity, its variety. And what we're trying to do, just in these sort of examples of cyber terrorism and whale watching and whale wars and everything else, is we're trying to move from ad hoc reactive analysis to actually continuous interaction. If I look at my simple 25 point journey, I can use the past as an indicator of the future. I can start to predict what I might want to do. If I'm a, a competitor to Starbucks, I'm the, you know, um, uh, the hot chocolate place, and, I'm a, and I um, use a uh, French or Belgian chocolate, I can use my behavior and my past to actually start to predict and offer me things which will change my purpose and change my intent. It can intersect me going to Starbucks and offer me something else. So location is this new lens. It's a way of thinking about things in a, in a different way, of bringing together social and behavioral characteristics and structured and unstructured data. To go into all of those tweets and say where, what, to extract 42nd Street, New York, Starbucks, to add 42nd Street, New York, Starbucks, <coughs> three pieces, three atoms of information, and bring them together in a context. You know, we want information scientists at Esri that can help our customers bring out those three separate, disparate pieces of information and apply that context. Time and space reasoning. You know, what does this mean? You know from my track that I'm walking, not driving. You know that from my track that, I, that I'm not obeying the traffic patterns. And yes, I'm not a New York taxi driver right, who disobeys the, taxi pad the driving patterns. But it's not just providing insight. It's enabling decisions. It's enabling people to, to improve service, you know, to generate profit, to do things in a very, very different way. And this language of relationships, which is geography, is really important. You know, when you start to do this, we naturally understand geography and context in ways that we've never thought about. You know, if I say to you, alongside, you know, mentally you're going in and you're actually saying, well, it's a linear relationship. So this thing is here and this other thing is next to it. But it's not just next to it. It actually has a relationship. If I say opposite, you understand what that, that means. If I say that it's neighboring, they're, they're well-defined connections. But near has a, is very abstract. You know, according to um, one of the presidential candidates who I think needs a geography lesson, you know, Syria and, and Iran, you know, are uh, one is the channel to the sea for the other. 
geography lesson, you know, Iran actually has its own sea in there, you know, and, and Syria is connected to a different sea, and there's a big gap between the two, yeah? But they aren't near each other in the context of the Middle East, yeah? But, where, but our sense of near varies. Our, our sense of near varies over time, over geography, and other things. So, you know, they're very much more abstract and attached and connected to and enclosed within and crossing. All these things become very important. And when we look at knowledge discovery, you know, in the Donald Rumsfeld world, you know, there's these knowns and these unknowns, and there's the known knowns and the unknowns unknowns, right? We connect these two things. And if we think about the unknown unknowns, that's really our knowledge discovery area. Taking something where I don't know anything about it, and I'm looking for patterns, I'm looking to retrieve information. And today, big data's focus at the bottom end. It's in, honestly, it's in the business intelligence space. It's about, you know, generalized reporting. It's about adding some extra context to this. But most of the focus about this is just about getting all of my big data and doing something else with it. But there's something else we need to do. We start to add location. We expand that out. We bring this context together and do something in a quite different way to what we had before. And so a lot of the work that we do is, is really about connecting lots and lots of data sets together, demographic information, market territories, all of these sources of information, thousands of sources, billions of points of interaction doing comparative analysis, performance, neighborhood. How do I work out the, the best performance of my Starbucks? How do I actually say if, if my number one selling Starbucks actually is meeting its market opportunity and potential? You know, in today's business climate, you have zero or slow growth. The people that are using geography are the companies which are driving growth beyond slow growth. You know, they're actually able to analyze and say, there's a context to this, which allows me to simulate, to evaluate, to actually go in and start to look at predictive analytics in a, in a very, very different way. So what do we have? You know, at the bottom layer, we have descriptive data. Most of the stuff we're doing today with big data is really descriptive. What we're moving towards now with big data when we start to apply different techniques is comparative analysis. I start to move in a different way that I compare the old with the new, A with B, B with C. But what I think is actually happening is more and more the technologies of big data allowing us to be qualitative and quantitative. We can actually say, what does this mean? How does it score? How does it rank? What does it do? And I think as we start to really have the expertise and knowledge applied to big data context, what we're really going to drive through is this idea of using big data to do predictive analytics. We'll change from the context of being purely descriptive, and those other parts of big data will reduce in their, um, the degree to which they're exposed and the degree to which we think they're important. You know, like many things on the internet, like many things that Apple produced, the complexity of the things in the middle will be reduced to the point that we're actually just taking this descriptive data and start to apply it in predictive ways. And we're already doing that in many of these different places. You know, we're doing geographic pattern analysis, hotspots, you know, data clusters. So doing linkage. In, in bank transactions, financial crime, fraud, you know, drug investigations, uh, crime pattern analysis, saying, well, who's the center of these? How do these networks connect? Where are we looking for in ranges? You know, these behaviors, taking um, deposit potential in New York and saying, are we, are we actually doing well as a bank? Where should we be doing better? Where are our hot spots and cold spots? Where with all these transactions are people not coming from? Where are they? originating. And are these patterns truly significant? Using spatial analysis and complex statistical analytics to say that these are actually hotspots and these mean something. So it's not just the big green blobs and the big red blobs, but actually mixes 
of blobs, mixes of red and green, where the, the um, convergence and the overlap actually mean something to those, to those clusters. And how, you know, how many times do we have exceptions? And how do I take all those billions and billions of might be coffee transactions and loyalty to Starbucks and say, does this make, make a difference? And these are being applied every day. You know, understanding from a, from a bank perspective, you know, where do 95% of my customers live? What do they do? How do I provide that, those capabilities? and deliver that to merchants so they can get involved. So ultimately, you know, location is something that unites and connects big data. It adds context that creates information. We go from data to information. Location analysis is ultimately about reducing the complexity so that we can go from that descriptive to the analytical to the predictive. We can expose those patterns and use them and ultimately try and generate some type of actionable insight. So, thank you. All right, do we have any questions in the audience for Dr. Thompson? Uh, I, I guess the, the one question that I had that, that I think is interesting you raise it, 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 there's a tremendous amount of information, as you pointed out, that we're all collecting via our cell phones that, that I don't think most people even realize that they are, that could be contextualized. And I think one of the things that, that I begin to wonder about is ultimately, ethically, who, who should own that information? Is it the responsibility of the individual to be aware of what's being collected and try and uh, perhaps exercise a little more control over it? Um, so, you know, one of the big questions I get from, from people is, um, if you tweet, is it public? So can I go and mine you, and can I then go and get, can I go and look at your, um, your email address and who you work for and all the information you put up, and can I actually start aggregating across all those different social media sources? And, you know, I think the challenge becomes, answering that question, is that you always get into it depends, yeah? So if I'm volunteering that information, it's in the public domain. And so naturally, people will want to combine all of, all of that information. You know, there's a dangerous point in which we start to aggregate and bring information together where the good starts to become evil. Yeah? There's a point at which what we, what we understand about what's possible actually um, exceeds our knowledge of what it is that other people can, can discover about us. And I think, to me, the challenge is, is that most people don't understand what can be brought together. How do we bring that information together? You know, what does it mean when I go and find Simon Thompson? You know, I used to, five years ago, say, not the triathlete and not the mathema mathematician, and say, well, what, who are you then? I say, I'm one of not another 19,000 Simon Thompsons that I've discovered on the internet. Yeah, but those two things are you know people said well okay what are you, who are you, and I think you know we really don't understand um, what these companies uh, are doing when they aggregate information. I don't think we understand when we when we tweet, when we share Instagram, when we do stuff on Facebook the fact that so much of this information is exposed, is exposed in terms of location and information that is mineable, and then how you can bring this across many, many different, different sources. And I don't think in many ways government understand this either. And I think, you know, our information policies tend to be in some, ha some ways sort of draconian. Um, and there's a dispute, you know, very active dispute at this moment going on in the EU about Google's kind of policy and, uh, on information privacy and bringing together you know, all these different end user agreements on information um, you know, into a single policy. Because they have so many products and what the, the government is saying is, well, you know, you're gonna use this to bring all this information together and you're gonna get this insight on people that they don't understand. But thank you for creating a single policy. On the other side, as a, as a um, somebody that's creating information, I don't know what it is that people might want to 
provide information on, on me and what they're going to use it for. So I get, you know, I get worried. So if I go off and buy, you know, a pair of um, red six-inch stilettos from Macy's, and I, you know, go out two weeks later and buy, you know, a, a size 14 skirt and, you know, some new underwear, are they going to think I'm a transvestite and going to start, <laughs> you know, pushing information for it? Or is it because I'm shopping for my wife and daughter and, uh, you know, a, a friend, or that they're using my card? You know, and there's a real kind of challenge about information use and the, the assumptions that people make about you. So I think, you know, part of the, the important part of this conference is to actually get some of these ideas out in there and start to say, how do we inform people about the information that they're sharing? You know, it's always good to think, should I? You know, because one, it's not fire and forget. Once you put that information out there, it's in the public domain. Most people could argue that I have a legitimate right to mine that information and connect two disparate pieces of information, extract the facts, and add context. And I can use that context as a business to target you. But when you have that simple discussion with people, there's that wary moment, and they think, well, should I, should I do that? Yeah, yeah, I think the, the thing that for me personally has always been a little scary is that people don't think of location as their personal asset. And, and as you pointed out, it's very easy to, you know, with, with a week or a month's worth of data, quickly be able to disseminate where people go to church, where they go to school, what they do for a living, what they do at night. Um, and, and I don't know that people always are conscious of, of that amount of data being collected. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the, um, you know, the apart from you know some of the issues about share price and being the biggest the biggest uh, company ever you know most of the stories about apple over the past um, couple of years which are not about technology have been about location they're mapping applications and this whole issue about how smartphone devices were collecting location and what was it being for so location is a fundamental human right according to united nation you know, that you have an address and everybody deserves that. But we share location all the time. And I don't think most people understand how important and how valuable and useful that location is. And I would argue that something like me, I share my location far less than I share just about everything else because I know what I can do with it. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, you know, turn off lots and lots of those notifications. Um, you know, if you can on the apps that you have, go and read the sort of information they collect and the information that they share about you. You know, there's lots of those, you know, the second, second or third, depending on what time uh, you looked at this overnight, most popular game in Europe was a location-enabled game. You know, you were slingshotting, um, uh, you know, almost like, um, yeah. anyway, come to me, Angry Birds, uh, you know, using bridges and locations all over the world. And it was mass, you know, mass play. So you're linking up with people. You can play in Sydney, you can play in, in New York, and use the, the buildings and things which are there. You know, there's, there's ways in which location is being shared all of the time on those. So, you know, be aware of the sensitivity of information, the things that collect location, how they use it. It's pretty hard to turn off your, um, off your GPS all the time because one of the things that happen on most of the smartphones today is it's using Wi-Fi to increase your positional accuracy. And so few people have thought, well, why is that? And it's actually because these companies have driven around collecting all the Wi-Fi locations and they're using that information to actually improve the GPS accuracy. Yeah, so that's to our good if, if we want to find something which is really close and now I'm 50 foot accuracy, not 300 foot, but it's bad if you're locating me. And you've got to reconcile for yourself this idea of the benefit of being accurately located and the benefits of being accurately locatable. Yeah, in versus out. Any other questions or comments? All right, okay, well, uh, we're doing really good on schedule. Thank you, Dr. Thompson.
and there was a question via Twitter if we were going to be posting the presentations. The video is, well, the video is being re video recorded, so it will all be online. So all these presentations you will be able to revisit again um, shortly. We probably will have it up in a couple of weeks. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a quick five-minute break, uh, and then we'll start with uh, Nico Dittata. Thank you. Okay, well, in the interest of uh, staying on schedule, we'll go ahead and get started with our next uh, speaker. Uh, next speaker is Nicholas Dittata. Um I met Nicholas actually through his previous work at Instead, which I'm, I'm hoping he'll, he'll talk about some pretty cool and innovative stuff. Uh, he's going to be talking about designing for the crowd beyond microtasking. Uh, Nico spends most of his time designing and managing software projects before starting his company, Manus Technology Solutions. Nicholas spent 10 years as a software architect and project leader for many organizations, including startups, large corporations, and acquiring a background uh, along the way in information retrieval, machine learning, information visualization, and web development. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello. Um, most of you probably heard uh, about crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and crowd, etc. Uh, but just a quick introduction. It's basically the concept, the concept of creating applications for a group of people that will collectively um, work towards a specific end or, or objective that you have. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about things that I feel that are not being um, tapped yet, uh, and there's a lot of uh, potential. Uh, hidden in designing applications with um, um, a broader spectrum of, of ideas. Um, right now, most of the crowdsourcing applications that you see outside are merely the sum of the parts, meaning that what you're getting out of the crowdsourcing is just the sum of each contribution being done by each particular person. There are a few examples with um, um, Amazon has a service, for example, called uh, Mechanical Turk that allows you to say, I need to, I don't know, categorize this much information. And you can split those um, pieces of information in, in microtasks that you can then um, outsource to a large population that will be getting, I don't know, 10 cents, $1, $2 out of contributing to each task. But at the end, what you're getting out of that process it's not, nothing more than the sum of each of those contributions. Most of the um, uh, crowd mapping, for example, is built of different contributions from people that are all over a, a specific region reporting things that they see or things that they photograph or things that uh, uh, are going on there. But if you had one person with enough time or with enough speed, there's nothing that he couldn't do by himself just by driving around and reporting everything that he's seen. Uh, other applications, like the one I mentioned before from, from Amazon, um, for like, um, classifying products, Amazon receives a lot of uh, submissions of products that need to be listed in their website, and they use the same technique to classify where each product should, should go, right? They put a product in your, in your um, crowdsourcing application where you say, well, this is a book or this is, a, I don't know, an appliance or this should go under this particular electronic category. And by using um, many people and many contributions around this, they are able to categorize um, the, those products in the, right, in the right areas. But again, there's nothing there that couldn't be done by a person with enough time or with enough uh, speed. There's, there's um, Another idea of describing pictures that's also used for uh, Google and eBay. Basically, you get an, a, a picture and you have to describe. So there's, there's a lot of things like that, but it's merely what, what, at the end of the day, what you're getting out of those processes is nothing else but the sum of each of the contributions. So the question is, how, how could you get something that is greater than the sum of the parts? What are the thought, sort of uh, crowdsourcing applications that you could design in a way that what you're getting out of that is bigger than the mere con ah, sum of the, of the contributions. So there's, there's um, this idea of using the, the dynamics of the interactions of the people to, to solve uh, different problems. So instead of just getting uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of time condensed in a short uh, duration, a lot of effort contributed by, by different people, you get 
an emergent behavior out of the way that you design this application. Um, and let, let me show you a few examples of this to make it a little bit more concrete. There's um, this is a, a quite um, old website that's been online for, I don't know, six or seven years. Um, but it's called Hollywood Stock Exchange. And what they do is basically they allow you to trade movies. So when there's a movie that's coming out before it hits the theater, so you can start trading stocks based on the value that you expect that movie to collect when it goes to the, to the theaters. So what they do with this is they try to predict what's the exact value that the movie is going to, to get once it goes to the, to the theaters. And they've been uh, doing pretty well at predicting that because basically they have a huge group of people that are trading these stocks and they, in the, their interest is to buy for less than what they expect the movie is going to make and to sell for more, right? So the, the value of the stock of each of these movies is a very accurate predictor of what how much money the movie is going to make when it hits the market. This is a nice example of something that it's not the mere sum of the, of the contributions of this. It's not something that um, just collects information from, uh, from each of the, of the contributors and put it in a bigger list. The, the value of each of the stocks is determined by the interaction of a large group of people and not by just individual contributions. Um, Another nice example is forecasting presidential, uh, presidential elections. Um, between this is this is even before uh, this IT um, era. During those years, there's been a huge market for trading futures on um, forecasts for presidential elections. There's a there's a very nice paper that has uh, go through through all of the of the bets that been placed during those years. And basically, the, the conclusion is that they, they've been able to accurately predict uh, every single president except only one. And that has derived in something that it's currently working and it's online and you can join, which is the IEM uh, run out of the University of North Carolina, where you can do exactly the same but online. You send a check to the university, they uh, deposit that money in your account, and you're allowed to start betting and trading on, on who's going to become the, the next president, president. All those examples that I mentioned before are called prediction markets. There's a lot of theory in the economy field about how to create those. Um, there's another very nice example inside Google. They basically created a prediction market for uh, predicting dates inside the, the, the company. So once they launch date for this product or that product or this other company, and basically people trade the, the stock of, of each of those launch dates based on the percentage, percentage of certainty that they have that the specific date is going to be. So if they think that, uh, I don't know, August 1st is the date for a specific event and they are like 70% certain, that that's $70 or 0 0.7 is the value of, of that stock. Um, another way of using a large number of people to, to come up with interesting solutions to problems is what's called wisdom of the crowd. There's a very famous experiment done by, by Jack Trainer, uh, which is called Jelly Bean Experiment. It has been done over and over through, through the years. One of the latest um, reports that I've read about this is done by Michael, and he basically asked a, a group of students to try to estimate how many beans there are in a jar. And the, the, the individual estimates are very off, like 62% off usually. So nobody inside the room is a, is, a, is a good estimator. But when you get the average of all the estimations of those, those uh, very largely uh, off estimates, what you get is a 3% error, which is much, much, much better than what anybody alone could do. And again, it's not because one of those specific uh, estimators is, is uh, getting a, a good number, but it's because you're asking a large number of people and reducing your error a lot. So th these sort of ideas could be used for many, many different things where, where you don't have any specific way of accurately estimating anything, but you have access to a large number of people that could give you some sort of uh, input. Another completely different way of using and, and tapping on, on the crowd to solve problems 
It's um, something done by a website called quirky.com. They basically came up with a, a design process that allows them to crowdsource the whole design process of, of new products. Those are real products that are being sold in many uh, places that basically were crowdsourced. And they, they have a strange uh, way of, of uh, describing this. The process is quirky. But the, the basic idea is that you can contribute in many different phases. You can suggest ideas for products. You can vote on other people's ideas. You can uh, contribute with, with uh, good names. You can vote on others' names. So the, the whole thing from the, the concept of the, of the product, the look and feel, the colors, the prices, the names, everything is crowdsourced. And along this uh, process, you can earn some sort of um, participation on the final, final product. For example, that thing on the left that you see is my profile. Uh, I'm not a very good contributor. I just explored a little bit. But if you see, those, those are all the products uh, that I've contributed with. And you earn some sort of um, influence percentage based on how much stuff you actually contributed and how many of your suggestions or uh, names or prices have been used uh, for the product. Um, on the right, you have a much more successful contributor there that actually made $80,000 out of his contribution, because basically what Quirky does is they give you a percentage of um, the, the money they earn, the profits they make by selling those products. So they, they are basically crowdsourcing the whole thing from the very inception of the products up to do the, the going to market strategy. Um, and you can pretty much make a living out of uh, contributing with most of these things. If you, if you take a look at the details there, most of his contributions have not been around particular ideas that were successful, but on input provided to, to others. So this is a, another very interesting way. There's no particular designer that's <coughs> contributing individual uh, product ideas, but there's a whole bunch of people that are coming with uh, many, many different things. I don't have a slide for this, but there's, um, there's one of the things that you can do. You can go online and create an account very easily. You can go through a survey for specific products where they will ask you how much money do you think this product is worth? How, what, what, what's the price for this that would make you think that it's uh, cheap or low quality? What is the maximum price that you would pay for this without feeling that you're being robbed? Um, another nice example of tapping into these this, uh, dynamic interactions is uh, Folded. You might be familiar with this. It's been in, in the news for, for a while. Um, basic, basically, it's a, it's a website that's designed as a game where you can um, try to fold protein chains. Um, folding protein chains is a very uh, useful problem to solve for uh, biology and, and medicine because it allows them to understand how that specific protein will work and what are the sort of um, um, drugs that could be designed to interact with a protein. Uh, and basically everything around uh, health works based on based on protein. So basically they, they put out protein chains that they know, but they don't know how those fold. And there's no um, computational way of predicting how a protein will work. But apparently people are very good at in intuitively guess how to minimize the size of a protein and fold it. So in the game you just see a, a large blob like that and you try to um, fold it in a way that makes it uh, as, as compact as possible. And you earn points, and you compete with others, and there's, there's all sorts of interactions that you can do there. You can uh, work together in a team where you basically improve on others' uh, folding techniques, and, or you can just go solo and try to beat everybody else. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting way of designing um, a game that engages people to actually solve a very real and, and, and pressing issue. right? Uh, it's, th this is being used uh, all over to like investigate uh, all sorts of drugs and, and applications in, in biology and medicine. Um, a completely different sort of game is called uh, alternate reality games. Uh, one nice uh, late example has been out, uh, I think it was two years ago, uh, it's called Work Without Oil, where basically people role play around a future, a possible future scenario. <laughs> they, they, they are, um, they, they get shared a specific set of uh, things that are going on. They go to the website and they get like 
okay, this is what happened in today, this is the price of oil, this is what's uh, going on in your town or here or there, and people try to um, role play around this scenario and create content as if they, that, that was the reality that was going on. So this is a, a very interesting way of exploring how people would behave, how they would react, how they would interact um, in, in different um, realities, right? Um, this other example is a little bit more complex. I need a, a little introduction around what's called genetic programming. Genetic programming is basically describing a problem as a set of uh, structures that you can then combine as if they were genes. So basically you can create a random populations of solutions for a problem. It could be like, I don't know, doing a calculation or solving um, um, a route around a specific path. But then you can um, create new generations by creating offsprings of those solutions and testing which of those solutions have better results. By, by defining what's, how does it look like that, that a solution is giving you a, a, a good result, you can select the offsprings that have uh, better to adapt to that specific problem. Uh, on the right, you can see an example of how you can draw the Mona Lisa, but doing this, in very few iterations, you basically create all sorts of, um, of algorithms that draw uh, by just overlaying triangles of, of colors and you can compare with the picture of the, of the Mona Lisa and see which one are, are uh, getting closer, right? So by just using that function as a feedback to this process, you can come up with an algorithm in like a matter of minutes that can actually draw the Mona Lisa by overlaying triangles of colors. So the way this ties to, to designing for the crowd is, is this. In, in, in that example of the Mona Lisa, the, the function that you have for deciding how close your solution was to, to the result you were trying to get was the actual picture. But when, when you don't know exactly how to define uh, what's a good solution, you could tap into the power of, 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 of a crowd and say, all right, you're going to get a lot of different images and you have to tell me which ones uh, you like, which ones are a good fit. This is a very silly example of how to do this. I haven't found a, a, a good way of, um, a good example that has implemented this in a, in a good way for a serious issue. And I think this is one of the areas that has a, a, a lot of potential. Basically, this website allows you to see pictures that have been um, algorithmically uh, produced with uh, just the, the same technique where you basically have a, um, an algorithm that creates a picture. And you can choose between different fathers and create new pictures, right? And this, the, you can then share or print those pictures in, in your shirts or mugs or, or whatever. Um, but this is using basically the, the, the um, aesthetic value of people that are participating in this to define which are good solutions for, for this problem and which ones are given the right to reproduce again in this uh, virtual environment. Um, so basically, the, the idea is to, to create this new um, design uh, discipline that would tie all these different components. We've been through uh, game design examples, market economy, evolutionary computing, and some behavioral science, and try to put them all those together to design interactions in a space, which could be a website or mobile applications or even real life uh, situations that would allow you to solve a problem that, are, that there's no other way of solving, that computing would not give you a solution, uh, just getting a lot of people and outsourcing huge amounts of, of, of computing power would, would not work. So basically you need an interaction <coughs> of people to come up with an emergent solution for that, for that problem. And that's pretty much uh, all I wanted to share. So what I, what I would love to, to hear from you now or during the panel discussions is what are the things or ideas that would apply to your, to your field of work that you think could be tapped uh, with, with these sorts of, uh, of solutions. Thank you. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead and stay up there, because sure, I, yeah. I, I think mm -hmm. that hopefully you'll get some good ideas. And, and I think just to start, you know, one of the things that I think is really fascinating about the angle that you approach is that I'm not sure that the crowd is self-aware of, and mm -hmm. I guess, of how powerful they can be when they're really contributing to scientific ideas. And I think that comes from two places. Number one, people don't think that the collective power is, 
is as valuable as it is. And then the other is that I'm not sure that, that other decision makers, whether they be scientists or, other, or others, necessarily always validate these ideas as, yeah, that actually would help mm -hmm. until they see the results, like with the, the genetic um, example that you showed or, or perhaps some mm -hmm. others. Um, but but I, I would be curious, what do you guys think? I mean, does anyone have ideas of where this could be applied? What, what types of things um, this type of technology could, could be used, using any of the examples that Nico highlighted? Hi, I actually have been thinking about a project in workforce development for a while. And um, the idea is actually to identify, basically find a way to organize, well, organize information about the job market and what, what skills are, um, or predicting what skills are going to be needed mm -hmm. in the economy and then creating, and then helping people identify where they are in relation to those skills, mm -hmm. and then identifying how those skills can come together as specific occupations. So um, I don't know if I have really teased out the link between that idea and the mm -hmm. um, genetic, I guess, I'm, call, I'm going to call it genetic mirroring uh -huh. sure. <laughs> um, idea that you presented, but that was one I had. Um, I actually have a question, though. Um, on the back end, how long does it take? Like, if you have identified a set of variables to kind of mm -hmm. make the project manageable, how long does it take to actually program, uh, I guess, one or more, the parent algorithms mm -hmm. to make that happen. Are we still talking about the specific um, genetic programming example? Yes. So uh, the, the, the technical problem there is pretty trivial. It's, it's not something that it's complex or, or difficult or that would take time to do. What I think is the challenge in these situations is uh, most of the examples that I gave, uh, people are just playing and they are doing that because it's fun or interesting or they have some spare time to, to contribute. But when you want to tackle a, a very um, real life problem or issue, you have to figure out how you can align the incentives of people to participate in that game or tool with the actual objective that you want. Because you want them to stay engaged and to really make an effort to whatever you're trying to have them do uh, to get to that objective. So, so the, the trick the, and the design discipline uh, would, would try to uh, like elaborate on those, on those techniques and methods. The trick is how you can design the interaction between people in a way that you align their incentives with the actual outcome that you want to get. So for example, in, in the, in the um, um, job skills example that you gave, how, how could you figure out a way to have people, I don't know, sell, exchange, value, rate skills in a way that for their own interest, they are doing something that will come up with a solution for what you're trying to, to learn. Like uh, if they had to like, I don't know, I'm just making this up, but if you, if you had a game where people hire each other and they just list a few set of skills and then somebody else like goes through the skills and hire, like you could create like a virtual um, job market. Uh, you could come up with like, what are the skills that are more successful, why people are choosing each other, or things like that. So, so I think that's the, the complex part. Programming, like uh, those algorithms, uh, it's something that's been done for years already. It's, it's pretty simple, it's not, it's not difficult. The, the complex thing is how you define your problem in a way that could be solved by those techniques. Great, any other questions or comments? Come on, there's gotta be one float. Yes, head. Oh, am I just missing? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think the poll was blocking my view. Um, for a little different twist on this, how do you vet your cloud? How do you know that your cloud is honest? Um, hmm. For example, I, I'll give you a trivial example. Um, a couple years ago, there was an iPhone app that crowdsourced traffic. Mm -hmm. And you could bring it up and find out what the best route to work is. Well, what's to stop me from um, <laughs> you know, writing a program or, I don't know, paying money to Mechanical Turk or something to have everybody go in, you know, put in all these fake sort of crowdsourced things that say the, the Lincoln Tunnel is absolutely hammered and get everybody to go up to the George Washington Bridge and then 
I'm going to set the world record for getting through the Lincoln Tunnel at 7.30 on Monday morning <laughs> because nobody's there anymore. How do you, you know, and, and I mean, that's kind of a silly example, no, but no, 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 depending on what the criticality of you're using your crowd mm -hmm. for, how do you know that there isn't some, I don't know, hacktivist organization or whatever that's purposely skewing your data in mm -hmm. one direction or another? How do you guard against that? Or is that a to be determined? No, I think there are two aspects to that. One of the one of the aspects is how much you really care about that last percentage of certainty. Sometimes it's better to be uh, precisely accurate uh, on time than to be like super accurate uh, late, right? So so you might allow for some some margin of error. The the other aspect is what would be the how the, how do you, again how do you design this? And it's all all comes to system thinking, right, and system, system design, how you design the, the interaction in a way that there's no incentive to do it that way, right? If you, if you design the tool in a way that there's, there's no incentive for you to play against, then you, you might have one or two people that are just uh, having a lot of free time and they just want to bother a little bit with, with whatever you did. But, um, but you, you, you have to find a way for designing these systems you know, in, a, in a way that it maximizes the incentives to do the right thing. And, and that people do it on their own interest, right? Um, the, the way, for example, that uh, Apple's maps work now for, for doing uh, crowdsourced traffic analysis is you don't, you don't contribute your data, you just, yeah, your application reports your location to learn how to get from a place to the other, right? So, so there's no way for you to say I'm here because the only way for you to report where you are is saying, I want to get here to there. And that there, it wouldn't make, make no sense at all to, for you to say, I want to get from like there to there if you're not in any of those two, two positions. Right? Um, so I think that, uh, again, I mean, there's, there's a margin for error. And depending on how critic, critic the task that you're up to uh, is, you might say, I, I'm, I'm going to like uh, register people and validate that they are real people. And, um, sometimes what some, some of these systems do is they create some sort of uh, mutual reputation where people um, vote on each other's contributions. So for example, if you go to Amazon, uh, on top of the comments and reviews for the products, people say how useful those reviews were. So you have a second layer of uh, mutual verification <laughs> where contributors that have been over and over uh, rated as like useful or valid or, or uh, good reviews are going up and up on the reputation scale. So there, there's a lot of literature around reputation systems and how you come up with a group of people um, that are, don't know each other and that you have no knowledge initially to come up with like people that are doing uh, good stuff and, and how you like um, validate each other. Yeah, a really, really good question. Any, any others? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, we'll move on to our next presenter. All right. So next up, we have Matthew Wilsey, who's going to talk about the crowd, open data, citizens, and sensors. Uh, Matthew is a designer and technologist, uh, dreams of ambient and pervasive civic engagement. By day, he consults with the public interest organizations and initiatives. At night, Matthew pursues tools for organizing advocacy that leverage network technology, but also integrates with the routines of our offline life. In all his work, he aims to reduce the divide between the mo moments of need and opportunity and our response through coordinated action. So I'll turn it over to Matthew. Thank you. Um, in the spirit of this uh, conference today, I've misplaced my cell phone. Uh, so if anybody sees a Samsung Galaxy, feel free to uh, test the limits of my uh, security <laughs> and uh, prospects of my future. Um, so in 2003, the uh, New York City transit system shifted from using physical tokens to a digital credit and debit system um, for gaining entrance to this transportation network. Uh, with this switch brought a lot of, of environmental concerns as well as concerns about privacy uh, since our rides could now be traced. Um, but a few interesting things emerged from this switch. Uh, couples can now be seen sometimes talking to each other from either side of the bars that are near the turnstiles uh, at the subway entrance. And um, what you'll see happening there is 
the couple is waiting for the requisite 17 minutes to pass before the subway pass will allow the second member of this couple to pass through the entrance of the system. Uh, so while this move from physical to digital uh, brought a layer of a new layer of data and surveillance to it, it also contained these integrated methods for subverting the system. Um, so my goal today is to reframe how we think about data and to consider some new opportunities for engagement, uh, in particular civic engagement. Um, ultimately, I believe that all this, the network and the hardware that we were talking about uh, here in this conference is, is ultimately about connections, creating connections between people. Um, so I'm going to pre present a, sort of a collage of observations that will hopefully hint at some future opportunities. Um, so the insurance industry is moving to um, some new systems um, that, are, that are pretty interesting. Um, up above here, we see a small palm-sized unit that a driver can plug in under the steering column of their car. Um, and this unit allows the insurance company to monitor a driver's habits. Um, so a driver chooses to use the system because they're offered the incentive of lower cost of insurance. Um, and then the insurance company is allowed to, or is capable of observing uh, where you drive, when you drive, how you accelerate and decelerate. decelerate. Um, and of course, we have to rely on them on letting us know how exactly, what, what information they're extracting from our car's computer system um, and how they're using that data. Um, but I want to step away from the big brother concerns of this system and sort of evaluate it on its own terms. Um, so if we think about the, the value of this system for the insurance companies, it allows them to step away from demographics for making educated guesses about how you might drive. And it allows them to rely less on accidents and tickets, which are discrete periodic events that hint at the driving that you do. Um, but those events need to be connected with, with calculus. Um, so this new system sort of reduces the distance between the layer of data and the thing that that data represents. Um, and I think what's scary in this is not the, the shift in the kind of information we are observing, because I actually think the, you know, the demographics or the profiling that's currently done uh, to evaluate your insurance rates is not necessarily something that we want to maintain. Um, the, the scary thing, obviously, is in the control and the ownership of that data. Um, so moving into the civic space, change.org is, is really a feedback system for civic engagement. Um, and change has taken the paradigm of surveys and canvassing and polls and whatnot, petitions, um, and they've sought to increase the ease of these systems, the speed, um, and by, mostly by integrating a social element to it. Um, but they haven't really changed the paradigm itself. Um, while change has been really successful in a lot of its work, I think that a lot of us would agree that there's, there's something a little bit shallow about what they're doing. And I think that shallowness doesn't come from the simplicity of the click, of the input, or the feedback that you're giving to the social system. Um, instead, I think the shallowness comes from the distance between the click and that it's not a direct indicator of your knowledge or opinion. I think that there is a great distance between those two things. Um, so to clarify what I mean by that a little bit, Imagine a, a university that's looking to extend its campus and it wants to plan you know, the pathways that connect the buildings in a really student-centered way. Um, they could put out surveys, uh, do renderings, and gather feedback from the student body. They could have people vote on one plan or another. They could embed, sen embed sensors throughout the, um, throughout the campus. Um, but all of these items require a calculus to bridge the gap between the distance between the data itself and the thing that it, it is meant to represent. Um, footprints, on the other hand, are a very simple input, much like we saw on the change.org platform. But unlike the click, they're very direct. Uh, they're continuous. And they don't require a calculus for us to make meaning of those data points. So Ushahidi is another platform that um, sort of rose to fame, I think, uh, following the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Um, this platform 
uh, shifts the paradigm a little bit in that it, it enables a, a group of people to distribute the task of gathering information, particularly with this platform and in Haiti, following a crisis. Um, and so you have you know, people spread, spread around a scenario who are able, with a smartphone, to submit a, a photograph, or even without a smartphone, send in a text message, or from a landline, place a phone call uh, and give some information about an incident or a problem or something that needs to be addressed. Um, so all of this information is gathered, it's encoded, it's categorized, uh, and then mapped on the Ushahidi platform. Um, and I think that, that that piece of its work uh, is very powerful. Um, however, once we map this information, we centralize it uh, and encode it, we're, we're again increasing the distance between the information and the thing itself. Um, and I think that geographically encoded information uh, really begs to be mapped back onto the location from where it came, so that that information is accessible within the context where it's most needed uh, by the people who generated the, the data or who could put it to use. Um, so Elaine Scarry, in her uh, book, Thinking uh, in an Emergency, discusses, um, she talks about uh, children walking around uh, India, uh, <coughs> chattering, laughing, holding hands, uh, moving through the streets on their way to school. Overnight in 1975, this activity became prohibited uh, because of changes in governance there. Um, and this activity was prohibited because it was a form of assembly. Um, and what it became, in, in her mind, is a, is a physical sign of severe abuse happening elsewhere. And I'd like to read a little something here. She says that the change of rights and laws often lacks any sensory manifestation. People who are not directly injured often do not even know that any substantive change in the laws has taken place. If at the moment that President Bush secretly authorized torture, the residents of the United States had been required to begin walking in single file, the enormity of the legal change might have been easier to grasp. So I think what this conveys is that no data is more profound than what's lived on the street. Um, I think we can look at previous elections for a hint as to like how we can put this idea to use. Um, so we are all, I think, grossly familiar with the hanging chads or the concerns with, um, that come with moving an election, election system from a paper-based system to one that's digitized. Um, but I think with the capabilities that are afforded to us from the technologies, the networking technologies and the sensing technologies that we've got, that we can actually step back and integrate older forms more physical forms of engagement. So the Iowa caucus, I think, is a fantastic example of that. And I don't know exactly what this would look like, but I'd like to imagine an electoral process that was as physical and as engaging as what you see there. Um, so as a designer and technologist, um, I am uh, looking at how we can apply these, these ideas um, to, a, to a particular community of people, um, community of uh, cyclists in New York City who move um, by bike. And uh, a couple of important things about this is that, in my mind, unlike what we've seen happening with insurance companies and drivers, is this for me is an opportunity for the community to own the data and the capacities that it affords. Um, what I'm also looking to do in this work is to really integrate the data collection with our routines so that we aren't gathering information like we saw with change.org through points and clicks that happen really separated from the activities that uh, we're dealing with, but instead within the routines of cycling through the city. Um, another aspect of that, like we talked about with Ushahidi, is figuring out how to not just gather, gather this data through sensing and GPS and whatnot, but to then bring that back into uh, the lived experience into the situation where the data is most, most useful. So I've been thinking about ways to make this output ambient so that a rider can have real-time alerts about an obstruction to their usual commute without having to map their commute or to you know, look up information about the bridges and the intersections. Um, and additionally, not needing to uh, centralize the distribution of these alerts, but like we talked about uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, crowdsource this information from the community of cyclists. I think we have an opportunity also to 
make to not just visualize the data, but to make it visible on the streets through signage that gives real time information about cyclists moving through the city. Um, so we could imagine a world where everything we do, everything we touch is sensing and giving us feedback about, you know, its network, its context, and all the other people who have ever touched this thing. Um, so it's easy to imagine information overload becoming a huge concern. Um, I think that, well, it's important to look at where this overload is coming from. Um, and I have an idea that uh, it, it happens somewhere in the middle of the process. So we gather this data from the real world. We encode it to make it more portable, more storable. Uh, in that process, we reduce the facility, uh, fidelity of it. Um, but I believe that we risk overload because the way we encode this information requires us to interpret the, interpret the data, to read it back. Um, uh, in the background here, we see uh, an EKG heart monitor uh, machine. And I think it's, it does something very interesting in that it's gathering data that it then gives back to us in a way that we can analyze and read and look for patterns, uh, for problems and whatnot. But it's also giving us information in an ambient way where the sound of this heartbeat in the background, without us consciously thinking about it, gives us really vital and important information about what's going on. And that information does not require interpretation. So as we take these ideas and bring, bring them back to the real world, um, one more example to consider as we, as we think about how to do this. Um, so imagine crossing an inter intersection in Times Square, a busy intersection in Tokyo, and it, it's easy to understand that no map is going to help you walk across this space. No set of instructions is going to get you from the northeast corner to the southwest corner. No diagram is going to help you navigate this space. Instead, we need to rely on our innate tools, our tacit knowledge and heuristics to navigate this complex space. Um, and these things, and so I believe that in an integrated and uh, ambient world, where we're leveraging technology to do some of the things I'm talking about, that we can start to address complex problems, um, the wicked problems that we face in this world, in a similar way. Less with maps, instructions, and diagrams, and more in tacit and taking advantage of our heuristic skills. Thank you. All right, thank you, Matthew. Uh, so any comments, questions from the audience? Again, the, the reoccurring theme here that I'm picking up on, of course, is, is that the, really the power of the crowd, right? That, that, that the people uh, together can, can really do some remarkable things. And, and um, what do you think is the biggest barrier to, to people realizing just what you've talked about, the process that they need to go through to, to help translate this? Um, to I don't think the greatest hurdle is with the crowd. I think the greatest hurdle is what we do with the information we gather from the crowd and whether or not we think that it's only valuable from a top-down perspective or if it's even more valuable to put that, that data and information back in the hands of the crowd so that they can put it to use as they see fit. There's a, is this thing on? You guys hear me? There's a, an interesting connection I would like to make back to um, one of the previous presentations, the, the question of how a community can actually own data. Uh, and you're implying that that would be an interesting goal, that in some way you would actually give agency back to a community by reestablishing the relationship they have with the data. Uh, and that either could be through both an, through analysis uh, or it could be through this kind of ambient manifestation and realization of the data. Um, it's okay. Uh, and so th this came up in, uh, in Simon Thompson's presentation as well, you know, the question to which there are layerings of agents and agencies that control data, observe data, do analysis on the data, and make that analysis and control more or less visible to, quote, the end user, which could be either one person or all the people in New York City using a bicycle um, and so forth. And there's a, a really interesting set of political questions there and power questions there in terms of, one, what it means to get possession of that data back. And, and during the break, you know, I was talking to Simon, when I'm essentially saying it could be that the cat is out of the bag, to use a term that is, that is used a lot right now, that we really can't get what we used to understand as privacy back. Right. We can't really get what we used to understand as ownership of something like information or data back. 
uh, it seems that you might be implying we reframe what we understand to be our relationship with data through, as you put it, tacit knowledge or kind of ambient register of that information. And there's an interesting political question there. Um, but y you see where I'm going with this. I I I'm curious, do you think that we can't regain that? Do you think it's a kind of a, an end game situation in terms of recapturing what we used to understand as privacy, what we used to understand as ownership? Yeah. I, I don't know that I have an answer to that question. I think that, um, yeah, to be quite honest with you, I, I, I'm not sure. I think that, uh, and unfortunately, I think that we can only, we have to proceed not knowing whether or not we can regain that. So, and, and it's probably not a very satisfactory answer to that question, but you know, I think that that question will endure, it will always endure. Great. Well, I think we got time for one more question. If there's one in the audience anywhere, no. All right. Well, uh, we'll take a couple of minute break, and then uh, it'll be the first uh, round of the panel session. So, thank you, Matthew. <laughs>